Nice to meet you. <laughs> Very nice to meet you too as well. And um, thank you so much for, for agreeing to, to have a chat with me today. That's all right. First of all, can you just explain to me and to everyone um, who will be listening to this interview, hmm. what does a production designer do? What's in your remit? So it starts early days with the script. That's the, that's our Bible, basically. We That sort of tells us all we need to know. That, and along with discussions with the director um, to get into his head, to find out how he wants to tell the story. So then I go back and come up with ideas for the set and how it should, how we could, how it should look. Uh, we obviously, the script quite often gives you quite a lot of clues. So we started looking at different um, locations for the exterior, because that would then establish what the interior looked like, if that makes sense. So, so, but it all starts with that script and, and discussions with the director and the director of photography, of course, as well, because course, yes. he's a, 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 king, a key, key player in the whole thing as well. So, and it's very much a team effort. Between us, we sort of come up with a, a plan and then it's up to me to come up with ideas for the visual. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you because because obviously Florian adapted this from a play he'd written. Yeah. So he must have had a very clear idea in his head yeah. how it should look. Yes. Um, and did you did you change his mind about how anything should be or did you very much go with his vision when you were having these discussions? I'm just fascinated to see, as you said, the script gave you a lot of clues. But when it's been so close to somebody's heart. Yeah, well, this this was uncanny, this job, to be honest with you, because I went to meet Florian. Uh, I had a few days, I had this, sent me the script and I had a few days to prep some ideas. And I went to see Florian and I'd, I'd sort of got various reference images and, and ideas and things, but I'd also draw, drawn a plan of the layout of the apartment, how I saw it in my head. Um, and I was, I, I opened my book and showed it to Florian. I said to Florian, I've got a plan. He said, well, you show me yours and I'll show you mine. And it turns out he'd drawn a plan as well. And which is very uncanny, they were virtually identical, which is wow. very rare to be on the same page from day one. And then in terms of the concept of the, the period, Florian, had, he'd been to Maida Vale actually, um, before he met me actually, he'd seen a, an apartment building that he liked the, or he liked the area he found an area that he liked so we went back and had a look at that the build the particular building we used was on the on, on a, a key corner it had shops opposite which is what he wanted and and it was very photogenic and so uh that the, the architecture of the exterior then set the style for the interior i also loved the fact that anthony when he wants to be calm goes and looks out of the window and in that one yeah. scene he looks down into the street and he sees the small boy playing keepy uppy with with the plastic bag yeah because when you get to know people with dementia, you realise that their horizons do shrink. They shrink as we get older quite a lot anyway, but that was always his window on the outside world, mm. uh, no pun intended. Uh, yeah. And that absolutely fascinated how, how that was his contented place to look out of the window. But the other thing I really remarked upon watching it that drew me in was this, the confusion of the similarity of the layouts. Yeah. How deliberate was that? Oh, very deliberate. That was one of the one of the key elements in the script was that um, one of the first things it says basically is the the architecture of the apartment stays the same, but the the dressing and the colours and the, so the furniture as such um, changes and uh, it constantly changes through the story. So that we're so he's all so he's always pretty much in the same physical space. It feels like he's in the same space. Now the only way I could make sense of this for myself because it, it, it is quite confusing even when you're reading the script is. Um, um, to tell myself that Anthony is in the care home from the beginning of the story so that so the geography stays the same although what we did with the layout is we tried to make it as confusing as possible we had loads of sets of doors uh, several ent entrances into like the living room had three sets of double doors and all the doors were the same so you never quite knew where you were in terms of the geography and the very long corridor sort of tied it all together I'd love to say it was spontaneous a lot of it but it wasn't <laughs> It was very calculated and, and we did actually, um, you know, fathom it all out beforehand. So <laughs> but it was it, for, for the viewer, it's absolutely mesmeric, very disorientating, and very dreamlike in its quality. And you mentioned there about the colours, the colours starting from the, the start of the film are brown yeah. and then you eventually go through to the blues of the nursing home. Yeah. Um, presumably, obviously, that's all very worked out at the beginning. But the tone of the colours interested me as well. How did you think that reflected the state of Anthony's mind? Florian used to say, this is a film about memories, you know, and it's about, 
it's about Anthony remembering his past and confusing his past with the present. And the colours really help to, to distinguish the different time zones in a way in his mind and where, he's, where he was in his life. So we went from the organic at the beginning with Anthony and then into the softer blue tones for Anne. And then it got it just gets colder as the film goes on, which, you know, I guess, you know, you could use that as a metaphor for, 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 for life just sort of moving on and, 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 and getting more, Stop. more smaller and, and, mm. and, and also, yeah, with the cameras, you know, we, we try to make the environment feel smaller, so more claustrophobic in a way. But Absolutely. Um, but I'm going to bring you back to doorways because one of the other things I loved was how many scenes were shot through those wonderful doorways mm. as if who is on the inside of the room who's on the outside of the room yeah and how are they observing the action that's going on in there yeah well the, you're right I mean that was the, they were a really important part of the whole structure of the of the set and also the story you know because Anthony's always on the outside or he feels like he's on the outside a lot of the time um you know, I think quite a few people have mentioned the dinner scene, you know, where he's standing in the doorway. There's that great shot of him standing there just listening, listening to them talking. And um, it, the idea was that we, we confuse, help confuse the audience with where he is, um, with the doors and which, which set of doors he's coming in, where's he, where's he going? Um, we wanted to get that sense of, of depth as well through the set so that, so that you, you, you felt you were in this, space but it, you look through doors into another space it's like you're looking into another not into another world but another time for me I, I had to watch it twice yeah because your brain is you're watching the action you're listening to the dialogue and your brain's going wait a minute that wasn't there which is yeah. very my, my father had dementia yeah. and uh, that's my whole beginning of my my association with Con contented dementia trust yeah. and I used to see him was beautifully portrayed by Anthony mm. sometimes going into a room that was very familiar and you'd see him sort of checking out that everything was where it should be and yeah. occasionally he'd move across and and almost like when Anthony's going up to see the picture yeah sometimes throw him that something wasn't quite where he was but that would depend where he was in time with his yeah. surroundings yeah and it's something might have moved 10 years ago but he would say why why is that there yeah uh, and that was that was it I just subliminally your brain noticing that things had changed yeah and and, and listen Anthony Hopkins portraying that role he he was just Incredible. I mean, everybody was in all, absolute awe. It was like watching a, an acting masterclass every day, of course, because, you know, he he brought in all those little subtle, because he obviously does his research. He, he had he had really, seriously, you could tell that he had really studied the subject and, and you know, observed and watched and listened, which is a, what he's very good at, obviously, you know. The scene which really brought it home, well, too, for me with my father that was so accurate was him when she finds him trying to put his jumper on yeah my dad was always tangled up in a brown sweater right yeah um and you, he didn't know whether he was putting it on or taking it off and it would be completely twisted yeah and also the, the buying time which i think he observed so very well which fitted in with with the, with the sort of stillness of those wonderful apartments you created mm. where he's buying himself time and he's just wiping his mouth which had a tissue balled up and yeah. i've seen so many people with dementia do that it's like trying to work out where I am and these yeah. little idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic behaviours yeah. that were, were so marvellously designed. But that was another thing I wanted to talk to you about was the, the stillness that you managed to get across in the sets, like mm. time suspended. Well, I think a lot of that comes with the, the way it was shot as well. If I can't take all the credit for that, because I think um, originally when we um, first were talking about this, the, how to shoot the film, how, how Florian wanted to shoot the film, um, he was very keen on repeating the same shots and the same angles um, for each stage in the story. So each apartment would have the same camera move so that we could use the same, exactly the same shot um, in each in each period of the film. So we have the same angle in Anthony's, the same in Anne's, the same in the in the care home. And, and that I think helped with that, maybe helped with that stillness because it 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 anchored you in the same place. It helped you feel like you were you were there if you if that makes sense one of the other things i noticed was how sparingly you use the exteriors as we've talked about the apartment and the rhythm of the apartment and mm. and and everything being small and not claustrophobic but mm. quite dark around the edges 
Yes. You've got that wonderful opening scene of Anne walking down the London street where life is normal and life's going on and the buses are going. Um, and then the other shot of Anne walking when she's left in behind in the nursing home mm. with that disembodied face sculpture in the mm. middle. What was the thinking behind choosing that location? Well, um, really interesting, actually, because that's Blythe House in Hammersmith, which is a, an amazing location, actually. Um, it's actually used by the V&A to store their artwork, um, but it gets used as a film location a few times. And we went to, uh, I'd wrecked that location for another film, actually, the year before, which, which actually that film didn't happen. So I knew the location and uh, it was on the list of one of the possible places for the exterior of the hospital. Earlier in the film, in a couple of scenes, we'd used the, a head as a as a piece of a dressing prop, you know, just as a in the background and a, scu or a, a, a sculpture and a bust, just to give little ideas of um, of the idea of a fractured mind to a little bit. But it, again, very subtle. You don't. It, we didn't. We didn't. It didn't stand out. It was just there in the background. So when when actually when Florian saw that. Uh, that statue, he was just couldn't believe his luck, really, in a way. Usually what happens when people go to that location is they cover it up, that statue. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we got permission to shoot it and use it. And it, just, it was just another metaphor in that whole, the despair of the situation, what you know, Anne's going through and, and how desperately sad she is because she's absolutely traumatised. And of course, it, you did use sparingly again the, the scene in the London taxi. Hmm just that wonderful intimacy of her trying to hold her dad's hand and him yeah. moving moving the hand out of the way yeah. and him yeah. just staring out at London dressed yeah. in his suit and tie I, that was just heartbreaking and, and and as you say her performance as Anne you just sensed her quiet desperation and when she's in the kitchen preparing and the lighting and that feel of the kitchen you gave her around her that she's alone with her thoughts, but still doing something which is very mundane, always coming back to the chicken, mm. um, was, was, was again just wonderfully done. Olivia has that, she has that empathy anyway, oh. as a person in reality, she's, she's a very empathetic person, so the role I think suited her brilliantly, um, and I think she, she portrayed it superbly anyway. It must be very hard, like an artist painting a picture, when you're designing a film like this, to know when it's finished to step back in a scene and say, okay, that, that's the set as it should be now. Quite often it's an evolving thing. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't have much time. This, the prep time on this was really short. Really? So in a way that forced our hand to a degree. So you have to make decisions quite quickly. So knowing when it's finished is always uh, a question when to walk away. Um, and usually it's because you have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time's up. You know, you, you can't play with it anymore. Um, and the, the shooting crew are about to walk in. So, you know, it's like no more fiddling around. And But what we did do, funny enough, it's interesting with the dressing between Anthony and Anne's is that we, it, it was conscious that we changed the orientation of the main furniture, the sofas and things in the living room. We had the different artwork, but there were similar sizes in, but in similar arrangements on walls. And that's always quite, that helped with the confusion. Listen, the best bit about... The job actually is that final when you finally walk out of the set and feel happy with it as the cat as the shooting crew walk in you know that's if it feels right and the other thing of course if the actors feel comfortable that's the most important thing um they Anthony Hopkins loved it which was brilliant I mean that's the best accolade you can have actually for Anthony to say that it worked for him um because I said at the beginning I'm I'm designing spaces for actors to work in so for them to do their job comfortably and feel confident in the space they're in. If they don't feel confident in the space they're in, it's harder for them to portray the character. You mentioned when you saw the film yourself, you were quite surprised, it even took you by surprise, changing mm. locations. Mm. What is it like to watch such an incredible creation you've done yourself and collaboratively when you go and see that on the big screen? What's the feeling you walk away with? Well, quite often it's, a it's not a surprise, but sometimes it's like, okay or you come out thinking mm, I wish we'd done that a bit differently you know you do you are your own worst critic but but quite often uh in this instance of course the script was so good and the story was so good it didn't matter if I'm honest because it carried you the, the script and the story carries it to achieve what we did in the time we had was um was great and we're all very proud of it really it was um uh yeah you know one of those one of those really rare films where you really are you work it had a fantastic script, a lovely director, an amazing cast, and a fantastic subject matter. So all of those together, um, it just worked. You know, it's a real, a real joy to, to 
to do and to to be proud of. Mm. Just a final question. You said your uncle had dementia. Mm. Um, how has being part of this film maybe changed your view of dementia um, or reinforced what you felt about it mm. as, as an outside observer and also because of your personal experience? Hope, hopefully it's helped draw people people's attention towards it in a different way to how it's been discussed before, if that makes sense, because it was shot from the dementia patient's point of view. Um, and I think hopefully that helps us all realise slightly how frightening and confusing it can be. But then having said that, I actually think it's quite often more traumatic for the people around the dementia patient as well, because I think they're the ones who are, they know what's happening. They're seeing this person change drastically in front of their eyes, aren't they? Literally. And their relationship right. with that person changes. Absolutely, yeah. It, it was the last few months that were the hardest actually hardest for my mum I think as well because she she was still very close and, and she mm, upset her I think a lot. Yeah um, I mean um, one of the reasons I got involved with this charity is because it un it teaches you the disability that's caused and the ramifications of that disability of not being able to reliably store new information it's not yeah. that you're getting something it's the information was never stored and the knock-on effect of that what happens when you try to make sense of the world around you and yeah. how you can mitigate that. And that's the fascinating yeah. thing. Uh, yeah. And the reason I'm so passionate about the charity and, and how people with dementia are treated. Yeah. But um, Peter, I'm really grateful for the time you've given it, to talk to you. It was an absolutely, absolute jewel, heartbreaking jewel of a film. Yeah. And everybody deserves the biggest congratulations for it. Well, uh, uh, Flo Florian's script was incredible to start with and, you know, and, and his, his determination and his um, commitment to it as well, actually, was, was and, and listen, everybody's commitment, actually, was one of those jobs where everybody pulled in and, and just, that everyone was passionate about it in a, in a way. It was one of those, one of those rare jobs. But, uh, but if it does some good and it opens people's eyes to it, then great. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm sure it will. Thank you yeah. so much for talking to me. Great. You're welcome. Nice to meet you. And you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.